Good evening, everybody. Um, we are recording this uh, this uh, time with Father on the feast of Saint Philip Neri, and uh, today I want to talk to you about this great saint. Um, you're getting this, of course, two, day, two days after his feast, but there's still a beautiful connection between him and the Feast of Pentecost. Um, here we have um, our great saint, St. Philip Neri. Uh, this is a statue given to me by a good friend. And he's a great saint, a saint of the Renaissance period. So we'll put him back here as my first and only uh, Easter egg to watch over our a little discussion, a few stories about the saint. Um, he, the general, the big picture, who he was, he was a Florentine, he was from Italy. Um, he founded the Oratory, the Oratorians. I'm sure you've heard of Father Faber, uh, who has a lot of spiritual writings. He was an Oratorian. Um, and he was also called the Apostle of Rome. He was a great saint who helped Rome in a time of crisis, in a time of, of, of immorality. And um, he, he wanted to go off and go to the missions of India, but he was told, no, your India will be Rome. And so Rome was the place where he had to, to um, really give his priestly life. Um, and he was really, I think he's one of my favorite saints, and I think it's, it's that case because he was a saint of great joy. He hated melancholy. He, he hated it because it was so antithetical to the Christian life. Um, so just a few little stories about the great saint and, and his life. We can't go through every detail of his life. There are books written about that that you can certainly read. Perhaps the more famous is one by one of his own apostles by uh, Father Galonio, Antonio Galonio. Um, he was... This is the first biography of the saint. My favorite, my personal favorite, is this one, which I acquired a few years ago by Cap Cardinal Capitolatro. It's a two-volume set. I don't know. It's kind of hard to find. I think I think I paid a pretty penny for that one. But um, it's worth it because he's, he's one of my favorites. He was a layman. He came down to Rome and um, just a very devout soul from his earliest years. Um, came and worked for his uncle down near Casino, near Monte Casino. And um, then came to Rome and decided he wanted to study and, and work in Rome. But one of the things that he loved to do was to go to the catacombs and to pray. Sometimes he would even go to the catacombs and spend all night in prayer. Um, I think about that. Whenever I go to Rome and go to, especially he loved the catacomb of St. Sebastian, which is right there near the, the Basilica of San Sebastiano. Um, but he would spend all night in prayer there in the catacombs, praying in union with the ancient Christians, the Christians of the first years. Um, and it's interesting because um, it's the first little story I want to tell you, and this is where we tie this into the Feast of Pentecost. Um, he, one of the years he was down there, and uh, it was right before the Feast of Pentecost. He was spending all night in the catacombs praying, and this is something that would affect his whole life. Um, he was, well, I'll just read it to you. I'm just going to read it to you. For the, this is from Cardinal Capitolatra's biography of the saint. Before leaving the catacombs, we come upon an event in Philip's life which had a great influence on all its subsequent course. In this event, we must study with care. It was in the year 1544 when Philip was 29 years of age and at the close of the spring. A great Christian festival was at hand, the great day which commemorates the first Pentecost, when all the apostles were gathered together with one accord in the upper chamber. And as they were praying, there suddenly came from heaven a sound of rushing wind which filled the whole house where they were sitting. So he's talking about this great feast of Pentecost. In like manner, the apostolate of Philip had its Pentecost, and it was the year 1544. And that was the year where you could say, the rest of his life was defined. He was still living in the world, though he was predestined to the apostolate of Jesus Christ and was already exercising part of its functions. So this is as a layman. He actually didn't become a priest until he had a vision of St. John the Baptist. And it was through that vision that he knew he should become a priest. 
Then he had no companions in his ministry, or rather, they were not as yet his associates in the apostolate as a priest, and hence none were present with him at the miracle of his Pentecost. Those companions will be given him by our Lord in due time. He was yet alone, and therefore he will be alone when he receives the gift of the Holy Ghost, a gift he will receive in the form of differing but little from that in which it was vouchsafed to the holy apostles. So he's going to be given a gift that um, was similar to the apostles. The outward symbol of that inward miracle was still, would still be fire, but it will not rest on his head. It will sink down into his heart. It is not a tongue of fire that Philip will receive, but his heart is to be a heart of fire. And therefore, the symbol will be a flame, whole and rounded, as of a globe or ball which goes down into his heart and pervades and clothes it all. A constant tradition, the truth of which is attested by uh, F. Consolino, as is recorded in his life, assures us that this marvelous Pentecost took place in the Catacomb of St. Sebastian, a spot well known, well fitted to the scene of a miracle so unwanted. Galonia relates that it was at one of the days immediately preceding the Feast of Pentecost, 1544, and that Philip was praying fervently down in the catacombs. His prayer was full of love, but as love is ever insatiable, he was employing more and more and greater love. And this longing desire was that, was that day united in Philip's soul with the thought of the Holy Ghost, of his gifts, of his divine person, the substantial love of the Father and the Son, and passing naturally from the thought of the Holy Spirit, so that, so that of the coming feast the whole scene rose up before him, the upper room at Jerusalem, the apostles praying together with Mary, ever blessed mother of Jesus, the sound suddenly heard as of a mighty wind, the tongues of fiery flame, and above all that full and sensible outpouring on the apostles of the love of God, so that they felt themselves other men, fit and ready to convert, to reform, and to sanctify the whole world with their words. So he's getting ready to experience something very similar to what the apostles did, the Feast of Pentecost. And you know, it's a shame because here, this is in the 1500s, 1500 years after the first Pentecost. And yet, as we're preparing for the Feast of Pentecost, you know, sometimes we think, well, what's the big deal? I mean, we celebrate it every year. What, what am I going to get out of it? Well, here's 1500 years after the first Pentecost. And because of this gr grace of God, um, his, we'll see his heart is going to expand and, and it's going to inflame him with his love of God that will endure throughout his entire, the rest of his life and make him into the great saint that he was. It all starts on this day, this Feast of Pentecost. Philip then was praying thus when suddenly his heart was filled with a great and unwanted gladness, a gladness all of divine love, mightier and more impetuous than he had ever felt before. Within him was a joy as of paradise, and doubtless he felt as St. Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration, Lord, it is good to be here. It was but a gleam, a passing gleam, too bright to last. And as Philip's soul was exulting in his gladness, the Lord revealed to his imagination, perhaps even to his bodily sense, a globe of fire which entered his mouth and sank down into his heart. The love of God overflowed from his soul upon his body. His blood cursed, coursed, excuse me, blood coursed, not cursed, um, so rapidly through his veins that his countenance was all lighted up and flushed. His eyes, his cheeks, his forehead all beamed with a ruddy and unwanted glow. The impulse of divine love cast him to the ground and he tore open his habit to bear and cool his breast and his whole body thrilled and quivered with strange emotion. It looked like a painful convulsion and he was in joy and not in suffering. It seemed to be some strange disease overmastering his body and was really only a new and most mighty work of the love of God in him. So it's what happened. And so his heart expanded. This globe of fire came down into his heart. It was so full of divine love. It expanded his heart so much that they, when they did an autopsy after his death, his ribs were, were a, uh, the size of a fist uh, re displaced from their original location because his, the palpitations of his heart. And that's why we saw uh, said in his mass yesterday, I think it's the offertory, um, it's a quote from the Psalms, cum dilatasti cor meum, um, you know, my, my heart has been expanded. So his heart expanded basically, and it broke his ribs, this impulse of divine love. It broke his ribs physically. His heart expanded, and his heart, heart coursed with 
with blood, coursed, not cursed, coursed with blood so much that they say he was always hot. Like even in the middle of winter, he would open up a window and uh, just, to, just to stay cool. He had a special permission from the Pope not to wear a kota, a surplus, when he was hearing confessions. So it was quite, quite a big deal. Um, this affected his whole life. It filled him, infused him with this divine charity. This charity showed itself especially when he would offer the sacrifice of the Mass. He went on to become a priest, as I said. Um, and this is before he started the oratory. So he was just sort of a, um, a priest living in Rome. And he joined himself with a few other priests in a place called Santa Maria in Valicella. And he would say Mass every day, but his Mass was so fervent. Again, Cardinal Capitolatro. Philip said Mass every morning, and in saying it, he united himself so intimately to his Lord that this union often became a rapture or an ecstasy. No sooner did he begin to put on the sacred vestments than the beauty, the goodness, the holiness of the divine victim he was about to offer presented themselves most vividly to his mind and heart. This inner vision was enough to fill his soul with a glow of holy love. At first he gave free course to his impulse of love, but soon it became so impetuous that he found it necessary to distract his mind from it. So here's a saint who had to distract himself from the Mass. <laughs> Otherwise he would go into ecstasy. I, I wish it was the same for me. He tried to push out distractions. Um, you know, as he says, and so it came to pass that whereas a priest strives by every means to collect his wandering mind to God before saying Mass, Philip was obliged to divert his thoughts from God. So he had to divert his thoughts from God just so he could get through the rubrics of the Mass. Remember I said in my, in my time with Father on is every Mass, public Mass, the priest's job is to go through the rubrics. It's not his own private prayer. And St. Philip Neri, so he would, he would have to... Um, he would have to uh, divert his mind. So he, he would even, he's known for loving cats. Uh, it's the only thing I, I don't like about St. Philip Neri is because I can't stand cats. Don't hold it against me, but I just don't like them. Um, he loved cats. And he would even have one of his cats walking on the gradine of the altar to distract him from the mass so that he, so that he, um, so that he wouldn't uh, be, so that he could get through the mass. One time a server, his server literally left for an hour after the consecration and came back an hour later and the saint was still in ecstasy. Um, all kinds of things like this, you know. Uh, he, they said too that he would have to do the elevation so quickly, um, otherwise he would just keep floating up with the host. <laughs> so next time you see a priest who goes pretty quickly through the elevation, maybe he's just... Uh, trying to avoid going to ecstasy. Uh, hmm. Anyway, maybe, uh, not me, but anyway. Without this, he could not command the attention required by the external rite of the holy sacrifice, and instead of saying Mass, he would have passed whole hours absorbed in God. It is a fact so unusual, so amazing, that it would hardly be credible were it not again and again attested in the process of his canonization. Um, they say it was a sight of wonder and awe when saying the Mass. He... He even, but he wouldn't allow people to come around to where they could see the look on his face when he said Mass. He didn't want people to be taken by that. They, you can see in Rome, too, I've seen it, the chalice that he offered Mass with that literally has teeth, his teeth marks in the cup, in the lip of the chalice, because for him it was so an intense an experience to receive uh, the sacred species, to drink the precious blood and to consume our Lord's body. They say he would hold the contents of the chalice in his mouth for as long as he could, little by little, swallowing the droplets. Well, for him, the Mass was more than just 30 minutes of an external rite, that's for sure. It was beautiful. But his spirituality, I think, is is something that we can all profit from, even if we're we're not... Mystics maybe like him. That, that's the beauty of St. Philip Neri. Thus, I think it's why I love him so much. He really was a Renaissance saint. He practiced a wide array of virtues. Yes, he was a mystic. Yes, he was consumed by a divine love that maybe we'll never even know in our lifetimes. But his spirituality was one of great simplicity, of charity, and of joy. And, and in this, we can imitate him. 
um, even his poverty. There is a, a funny story in his life where a good friend of his had bequeathed to him his, his inheritance. And St. Philip Neri loved poverty so much that he told his friend who summoned him to his deathbed, <laughs> St. Philip Neri said, you know, you wretch, you're leaving to me your inheritance. I don't want your inheritance. You, you're, you know, what are you trying to do? Hurt my, my love for poverty? And so he worked a miracle and basically forbade his friend from dying so that he couldn't get his inheritance. That's how much he loved poverty. Well, um, if only everyone was like that, huh? But uh, so he worked a miracle and didn't let his friend die so that he couldn't get his inheritance. Uh, that's what happens when you have a saint for a friend. But his spirituality, again, is just is so beautiful. It's very simple. It's, there's nothing, um, and, and I'll give you a, little, a short little summary of it here, uh, from, as Cardinal Capitolatra says. There are two points in St. Philip's spiritual method, when viewed in general and as a whole, which make it worth our, our study and predispose us to love it. The first is this, that it offers itself to us just as the Middle Ages were passing away and the modern time was beginning. It is thus fresh and young and precisely adapted to the times in which we ourselves are living. And the second is that it did not grow up in the desert nor in the solitude of the cloister, but in the very heart of Rome. Again, remember he was sent as the apostle of Rome. Excuse me. Um, so his spirituality developed here in the heart of Rome. And so it is a method suited to men of every Christian, excuse me, every condition of life and to all who wish to live as Christians and to attain perfection. It is a method which puts no insuperable difficulties in the way, and which yet sets no limit to the soul in its ascent toward God. So it's a spiritual developed in the middle of Rome, a pagan, I mean, at that time it was Christian, it was Catholic, of course, but it was still, there was a lot of decadence at that time, in the 1500s, late 1500s. And, um, so it's a spirituality that it's for every condition of life. You can be a noble, you could be a peasant, you could be a priest, you could be a layman, and it's a spirituality that, that can work for everyone. So it's a, it's a wide-ranging spirituality, and it's neat because this great saint himself practiced mortification. I remember him saying, you know, talking about meat, he said, thank God I don't need that anymore. Uh, he practiced, you know, feats of asceticism, really sleeplessness and he suffered a lot and a lot of sicknesses and, and, and everything. And yet his expectations of others wasn't, you know, uh, a monastic asceticism. Uh, it, it was, you know, they say that for if you were dejected and downcast, he would come and fill you with hope and encouragement. But if you were proud, he would humble you. And I'll give you a few, a few stories of that. Um, but that's his spirituality in general. Uh, here we talk a little bit about, here's just a few quotes of him just to expand on that a little bit. This is St. Philip talking. I do not like confessors to make the way of virtue too difficult, especially to those who are newly converted. They should not irritate them by reproving them with anything like harshness. Very often they get terrified of the difficulties of a way so new to them and turn back again and live a long time in their sin without confession. Let us, on the contrary, use our every effort to gain them to Christ by compassion and sympathy, by sweetness and love. They say his spirituality is very akin to the spirituality of St. Francis de Sales. They live close to the same time. So a, a spirituality of compassion and sympathy, of sweetness and love, let us stoop down to these souls, to them as far as we can. Let our aim be to enkindle in their heart the love of God, which alone can enable them to do great things. And one time he was in the confession, he said to the, to the penitent, for the love of God, my son, tell me your sins, for God is waiting to forgive them. God is waiting to forgive them. Just, just tell me your sins. Don't be afraid to go to confession. Even if you have the worst sins in the world, don't be afraid. God, God's here waiting. My hand's ready to absolve you. My, I'm ready. I'm a minister of God. I'm an instrument of God. And his sacred heart is there ready to forgive you. That's his spirituality. It's a sweetness. It's a simplicity. Um, a joy. You know, um, let's see what else we got here. Yeah, it's a spirituality of, of humility, though. 
it truly is. He, he loved to practice humility. There are numerous accounts in his life of him practicing humility. I'll just read you one. Um, you know, he hated anyone sort of, you know, um, kind of uh, speaking well of him or, um, you know, trying to puff him up. And he, he was talking to a lady once, and this lady had heard of Philip's great virtue and began the conversation with him. And she asked him how long it was since he had left the world. Philip pretended to undertake umbrage at this question. I don't like that question. And said, I don't know what I have, if I have ever left it. And then turning to Father Galonio, he said, I say, Antonio, do I still not take pleasure in pretty books, poetry, and tales? But Galonio, whose veneration for Philip was exceedingly great, either did not or would not understand his meaning and answered quite simply, What wonder, Father, that you amuse yourself with poetry and tales since you cannot in any other way moderate the ardor of your love of God? That wasn't the answer Philip was hoping for. Philip was much displeased with this answer and abruptly changed the conversation. Then when they got home, he and Galonio, Father Galonio, however, he rebuked Galonio saying, There now, a pretty answer you gave me. May God forgive you. Whatever came into your head that you should say such a thing as that. So, um, Philip's pious intention is seen even more clearly on another occasion. Lorenzo Altieri, a Roman noble, wished much to see the saint and went to visit him, expecting to be greatly edified. To his great surprise, Philip began to laugh and jest and behaved just like an ordinary man of the world. Altieri could not refrain from expressing his astonishment to Angelo da Bagnorea, a great friend of our saint. And Angelo mentioned this to Philip and urged him to conduct himself with more gravity when Altieri came again. Here's Philip's answer. <laughs> Why, what do you want me to do? I suppose you want me to be on my very best behavior, that people may say, this is Father Philip, who says so many fine things. Be sure of this, that if he comes again, I shall behave a great... <laughs> he says, be sure of this, that if he comes again, I shall behave a great deal worse. So he would sometimes even act like a buffoon when people were expecting to come in the presence of a great saint. That's, it's his simplicity, and it's, of course, a humility, which is truth. It's, it's I'm nothing. Um, but it, this is his simplicity life. He didn't want to put on airs, right? I mean, he was friends with Cardinal. He was friends with the greatest saints of his day. He was friends with St. Charles Borromeo, St. Ignatius of Loyola, you know, St. Camillus de Lellis, St. Alphonsus de Liguori wanted to become a, an oratorian. Um, so he knew great men. He, he rubbed shoulders with cardinals all, all the time. Um, but he wasn't going to be, you know, be mused by that. And there's a story recounted where uh, he was told, hey, there's this lady, there's this woman in this convent who is claiming to have visions. Can you go and kind of talk to her and, and let us know what you think? And so he goes to the convent and he knocks on the door and, um, and he says, uh, I'm looking, for the, I'm looking for, the, for the saint who's having visions. And well, it was the lady who was claiming to have the visions herself who was the porter and who answered the door. And she said, oh, that's me. And St. Philip Neri just left and went back. He says, she's not really having visions. She's no saint. <laughs> For him, it was enough. She said, oh, yeah, that's me. I'm the saint. Nope. Sorry. Another, he was great friends with Cardinal Baronius. Um, Cesare Baronio. Actually, I don't know if he was the cardinal or not. I might be wrong on that. But... Um, there was a Cardinal Baronius at the time. I don't know if they're the same person. Anyway, Cardinal Baronius is known. He wrote, uh, I think it was a th uh, multi, multi-volume history of the church, which St. Philip saw as very important for fighting against Protestant Protestantism of that day. And um, Cardinal Baronius was, or excuse me, Cesare Baronio was a, a great intellectual. I mean, he was very intelligent, very intelligent. But again, St. Philip Neri, to humble him, uh, he made him rewrite these annals, which, I mean, it was multi-volumes. He made him study it on his own. He left him to study it and work on his own, didn't give him any help, uh, in addition to doing a, a barrage of pastoral work. Um, but he made him rewrite these annals seven times. Seven times he commissioned him to rewrite them. He also would humble Baronius by making him do the, the, the simplest work in the kitchen. And uh, there's a testimony, a letter from Baronius later in his life where he thanks the great Saint Philip Neri 
Pippo Buono, as he, they called him, good Philip, Pippo Buono. They, he, he wrote and thanked him for humbling him and realized, he said, at the time, I, I kind of despised you for being so harsh to me. It seemed like harshness. And yet I know what you were doing was there to keep me in your spirituality of humility. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, so um, one last story just on his, his joy. Um, we have seen that St. Philip was always cheerful and even merry. His heart was never clouded with morbid melancholy, but bright with a serene and sunny gladness. And yet his life was not one which would naturally tend to make him cheerful. He lived in evil days. He was always amidst the throng of sinners and the sick. His own illnesses were many and severe. He had his full measure of persecution and wrong. Of the innocent joys of life, with the single exception of holy friendship, he permitted himself little experience. That sweet cheerfulness of heart which seems so wonderful to his contemporaries and accompanied him to extreme old age sprang from one source, the abiding thought of God. We see this all along his life. When we realize to ourselves the long hours Philip passed in prayers, living as he lived in the heart of Rome and ever intent on the salvation of souls, when we think of his mass, of the violent efforts he was constrained to make to prevent his ecstasies, and of the causes and effects of the bounding exaltation of his heart, we have come upon the source of that irrepressible gladness of heart, that playful manner of speech, that joyous festal look, which endear him to us as they endeared him to those with whom he lived. Philip saw God always and in everything, and hence flowed his abiding peace of soul and the cheerfulness which nothing earthly could dim. As he said, to his disciples, my sons, be cheerful. I want you never to commit sin, but to always be cheerful and gay of heart. One maxim of his was, a cheerful and glad spirit attains to perfection much more readily than a melancholy spirit. Now, there, there are tons of stories like that here in his biographies. but um, and, and he loved the youth, too. He would tell the youth three things, you know, three things for the, for the young people. Um, the first was to receive the sacraments frequently, especially confession. Young people, especially as they come into their years of puberty and such, they need to go to confession frequently. So go to the sacraments frequently, and of course the Eucharist as well. Go to the sacraments and Mass frequently. That was his first counsel. The second counsel was to practice purity especially, to love this virtue of purity and chastity, and for this, to this end, to use devotion to the Mother of God. So pray to the Mother of God, pray to Our Lady frequently for the virtue of purity. Focus on that virtue. It's not just not being impure. It really is practicing a purity of heart, custody of eyes, mortification of the senses. And it's especially helped by the, his last maxim. So the third was to shun idleness of life. He would do everything in his power to keep the young people of Rome around him busy. And he's even known for saying, you know, um, they can, if I can keep them from being idle, they can chop wood on my back for all I care. And he, he, would, he would even sometimes use, you know, get them to play games and things outside of Baronius's uh, room to even make noise and kind of uh, make Baronius's work a little bit more difficult because he was such a bright intellectual. But that's just how he used the youth sometimes to, uh, to, to humble his, 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 uh, his friend Baronius. They were great friends. They really were. So this is the saint. I mean, he's, he's, he's really a Renaissance man, practiced a wide range of virtues, and uh, spoke to a wide range of people. He was friends with, you know, the greatest cardinals, but he was also always with the sick and the poor and the humble. You know, he was known for doing his visits to the seven churches, uh, the seven great basilicas, the major basilicas of Rome. He would even sometimes every day go with large crowds of people every day and make sort of a picnic of it and go we go to the seven basilicas of rome walking um it would sort of be like a little pilgrimage they would sing songs it was this is what he did he spent a lot of time with these kinds of people with he was known for spending a lot of time helping the prostitutes of the city he wasn't afraid to go out to them just like our lord so this is the saint he's a great saint and and of course i don't want to forget to mention he founded the oratory uh, the the oratory it's kind of interesting in a way. It's it kind of reminded me, reminds me of the society a little bit. So the whole goal of the oratory was to find a way 
to, they weren't religious, they didn't have special vows, of course, as a priest, they were priests, so they had, of course, the vow of chastity, as we all do, um, but they didn't have any special vows, poverty or, or you know, stability or, or anything like that. But his whole goal with the oratory was to make religious habits um, more prominent in the secular clergy. He saw a real problem in the secular clergy. You know, maybe like nowadays we see, you know, priests not really acting like priests. Uh, he saw a real problem in the secular clergy of his day, of people just being very worldly. And so his whole goal with the oratory was to have little communities of priests, of these secular priests who would kind of come together and live sort of a religious life. Again, no specific vows, a certain, okay, a certain obedience, spirit of obedience to whoever the superior of that community was. But it's, it's very similar to the society. Uh, we have our prior, the, the priest who's in charge of us and who gives us our orders, of course. Um, but, and we live, but we try to live the spirit of these vows. We, we have a very active ministry, but we try to live the spirit of these vows. And of course, we try to ha take on these habits of religious life, the divine office, prayer in common, you know, uh, eating together. Uh, these things that give stability to us to keep us from being activists in the public ministry. And so that's kind of the idea of the oratory a little bit, uh, to create these religious habits in the secular clergy. Uh, so um, anyway, that's the great saint that he was. He died on the Feast of Corpus Christi uh, there in, um, what year is it? I, I don't remember the year and I don't think I wrote it down, but uh, May 26th was the feast, as, um, the day of this recording. So. Uh, let's pray to the saint, especially when we're feeling melancholy. Maybe take up one of his biographies. You can find a few of them online. I think the one by Galonio is kind of the classic. It has a lot of anecdotes in there. And um, so may our great saint, St. Philip Neri, uh, watch over us and um, especially prepare us for the coming feast at Pentecost with, to help create in us this great ardor, this great love of God that will take care of everything, quite simply. God bless you. Good night. And uh, hey, come... Come to the groundbreaking, too, in, in a few days. Um, it's going to be a great event. Really, what a beautiful thing to, to build, start the building of a church there on the great feast of Pentecost when the church was, was formed, when the soul of the church was infused into the church. Uh, so see you Sunday at 11 a.m., hopefully, and for the rest you can't, we'll be live streaming it here at streamthemass.org, uh, or .com, sorry, streamthemass.com. All right, God bless you and good night.